Okay, we're going to go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you and we thank you for this chance to gather together to hear your word. Father God, you have given us all things we need into that pertain in life and godliness. You've given us your Son, you've given us your Word, you've given us the Holy Spirit, you've given us the air we breathe, you've given we all that we need. So Father God, I pray and ask that you would do a work in our hearts and our minds, that this Word would enter into our ears and enter into our heart and our mind, and that you'd help us to treat it as it is, the truth of your Word and your will, and that it would bear forth fruit in you. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my sermon today is called, Where Are Your Roots? Are they in Jesus and His Word? Are they in the Holy Spirit? Are they in the nature and character of God? Are they internal values? Are they in heaven? Or are they in the earth? Are they in the news? What's going on around you? Social media, entertainment, fantasies. Are they in greed and covetousness? Are they in perversion? Are they in anger or bitterness or hobbies or your own desires? Or are you living for your job or living for other people instead of living for Christ? Where do you think your reach do deep? Where do you get your life? What moves you? What what causes you to get up in the morning? What do you love? Uh, if we go Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Blessed is the man who who doesn't look to the world for his advice, who doesn't look to the news for his education, the world for his education, for his news, for his rest, for his relaxation. Blessed is a man who does not stand in sin or who does not run to the world. Like, let's say you go through a test or trial and tribulation, so you're like, I need to rest, I need to relax. So you sit in front of an ungodly movie or you run to watch things you shouldn't do. Or in other words, you're not supposed to be like the Hebrew children who ran back the Egypt anytime something went wrong. You're not supposed to stand in the same path that those who are ungodly do. You're not supposed to get your life, your hope, your joy in the world. And it says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So you go to the word for your vice. You stand on the word. You set your life by the word. You set your goals by the word. And you have faith and trust and delight and hope and rejoice in Christ and in his word. And it says, but his delight, what he loves, what he trusts in, what he hopes in, what he rejoices in, the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And it says, as you find your delight in God, in his word, as you meditate in Christ, in his word, night and day, as your eyes be single, as your mind stayed on him, as your heart stayed on him, as you love his word, as you abide in him, and he abides in you, as you saturate yourself in him, you will be putting forth your roots deep by the rivers of living water. He says, And ye shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in a season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he doeth shall prosper. So you, as you delight in Christ, as you delight in his word, as you go to the word for your counsel, as you stand upon the word, as you hold on to the word, as you set your word as your goal, as you find your hope, your trust, your joy, and your light in God and his word, then you will be a well planted tree planted by the rivers of water you will have deep roots and your roots will go straight into the river of living life your roots will be deep in christ and if you need love his love will flow through you if you need peace his peace will go through you if you need joy his joy will go through if you need hope his hope will go through you you need victory you need healing you need grace you need uh love and patience and long-suffering kindness all these things of Christ and of God will be flowing through you when you are planted in Christ and his word and he says you will and then it goes on you will bring forth your fruit in your season you know whatever uh plant soaks into its roots if it planting let's say if it's planting poison it'll die it'll shrivel up or if it doesn't have water the shrub will die or let's say it's planted by sewage water it, it might stink or it might not taste good or it might sour the food or it might struggle to grow properly I mean, God does create all kinds of amazing things of purifying, but we are a plant that needs fresh water. God will help us as we, as you know, it says, uh, 
he says, if you draw nigh, I draw nigh unto you. He says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you will have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we are not some kind of plant that can naturally purify us. We've got to find our life in Christ, and he helps purify us. But if we don't find our life in Christ, we will shrivel up. We will die. We will not be able to produce fruit. And he says, his leaf also shall not wither. When you're seeking Christ, when you're crying out to Christ, you will be an evergreen tree. You will not be shriveled up. You will not die. You will, you know, you will not look like you're losing. You'll not be wilted, but you will have, you will always be looking to Christ. You will always be trusting and resting in him. You will always have a thankful, grateful heart when you are rooted and grounded in Christ and in his word. When that is where you get your life and not the things of this world, he says, whatsoever ye do shall prosper. You know, in the modern day church, we kind of, sometimes they preach self-confidence and sometimes they, they preach that you need to do this, you need to do that. But what we're not, we're not building a firm foundation in Christ. Our confidence, our faith, our hope, our joy, our life, our dreams, our visions, everything about us are supposed to be in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear in him in glory. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Our life, our hope, our joy, everything is supposed to be in Christ. We're supposed to be deeply rooted in him. Our roots are supposed to be in him and not other things. Ephesians 3, 16 through 17 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by might by his spirit in the inner man. He says that he would grant you according to the riches, the abundance, the wealth of his glory. Now, there's another scripture verse that says we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So you could say according to the riches of his divine nature and character, his divine enabling to overcome the world, according to his word, it would work in in our heart and our life that we might be strengthened by a spirit in the inner man. You know, the Bible calls it the Holy Spirit a promise. It also calls it the spirit of truth. So, and he says, I, the Holy Spirit will bring back to memory all things that I have commanded you. So what the word, the Holy Spirit is supposed to bring back to our members what Christ said in his word. It's supposed to comfort us in the word. It's supposed to strengthen us in the word. It's supposed to lead us and guide us by the word of God. It's like the breath of God upon the seed the wind and the rain, and all of a sudden it brings forth a bountiful crop. And he says, by his word, by his grace, he will strengthen you by his Holy Spirit, by his spirit of truth, by his spirit of promise, by his spirit of earnestness in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, right there, that root, that taking root in Christ, rooted and grounded in love. And he says, how? He says, remember what the Bible says, faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as you know who Christ is, as you draw closer to Christ, as he becomes what you look at, as he becomes what you think about, as you meditate upon him, all of a sudden faith will arise in your heart and you will find yourself rooted and grounded in love. You will find yourself loving Christ, trusting Christ, hoping in Christ, rejoicing in Christ. You will find yourself rooted in heavenly things instead of the world. And he goes on and he says in the next verse says, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes all understanding which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. He says, when you are in him and he's in you and you are rooted and grounded in love and you know his will and you have faith in God because you've saturated yourself in the word of God, he says, you'll be able to know who God is, the height, the breadth, the length, the depth. You will know his love and his mercy. You will know his holiness and his, ju his judgment. You will know his truth and his promises and his warnings. You will know all of God and he says, and you will know the true love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. All of a sudden, you will know that God showed his love upon the cross. Therefore, the devil won't be able to lie to you and say that God doesn't love you. You'll know that he says, cast all your cares upon him because he cared for you. You know he cares because the word says it. You know, 
he who spared not his own son, but freely gave them all, how shall he also not with him freely give us all things? You will know that you can come to him in anything, whether it needs to overcome sin, whether it needs peace, whether it needs comfort, whether it needs healing, whether it needs deliverance, whether it needs wisdom, whatever you need, you will know who Christ is. You will know the love of Christ and it will overwhelm you to where you love him because he first loves you, where you trust him with all your heart, where you delight yourself in him, you rejoice in self in him. And what does this come from? This comes from sinking our roots deep, like in Psalms, where we get our life in Christ. But remember, the Christ, when he came, and the word was made flesh. So we know who God is because we've saturated, we've dug ourselves deep into the word of God. And I'm going to discuss here about, you know, the wise men build his house upon a rock, and it talks and it compares the word of God to the lamp, to the light, to your roots, all these different examples. And so we've got to root ourself in who God is, and that's in his word. We've got to meditate in his word night and day that we can be, do all that's written therein. We've got to eat and drink the word, to eat and drink the blood and the, and, the, and the meat of Christ. We've got to know his word. We've got to know his will. And he says, when we are rooted and grounded in Christ or in the word made flesh, when we know who God is, we will know his love. We will know all that he has for us. And we will be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, there's some people, they preach about how the Holy Spirit reigned on them and their prayer and all these, these are truths. But what, ha what a lot of people don't seem to mention is that for three and a half years, Jesus was the word in front of them, showing them who God was. He taught the word of God in truth. And he says, you are my disciples because you love me. Because he says, you keep my commandments, therefore you love me. And he says, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will then know the truth. You will then know who I am. You will know my will. You know, even though Jesus is right in front of him, he says, you've got to continue in my words. You've got to continue in the Bible. You've got to continue in the truth. Therefore, you will see who I am. And it's not just because we need that and we do, but it's also because the devil is always around us trying to be like the birds who steal the seed or the hardness of heart that that doesn't want to repent, doesn't want to turn from sin, or the, the greed and the covetousness and the lust of other things like those thorns that want to choke out the nature and character and the will of God. So we've got to keep a heart tender before him. We've got to have his word in our heart and our mind to where the Holy Spirit can breathe on it and bring forth fruit. Then we'll go on in the next verse. It says, Now unto him that is able to do it exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So all of a sudden, unto him who's able to heal you, who's able to keep you from sin, who's able to keep you in peace, who's able to keep you in joy, who's able to fill you in forgiveness and, not, uh, and gentleness and kindness and long-suffering, who's able to move through you to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, who's able to provide all your needs, who's able to enable you to shine like the stars in heaven, to be light in this world and sought in this world, who's more than we could ask or think. You know, if you combine all of what God has done from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, if you show all the testimonies of people who have moved by God exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, what he's done for them, if it's necessary for you, he will do for you, but exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. All these things God would do for you and more if it was necessary and you would follow him and know him. He says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He upholds all things by the word of his power. But what, where are roots? You could say all humans have spiritual roots and they're drawing from certain wells. Are they drawing from the well of life or are they drawing from sin and perversion and lust and ungodliness? Where are you getting your supply? What are you holding on to? What do you love? What do you delight in? What is your life founded upon? And that is what you produce. That's why the Bible says, be not deceived, guys, not mock. For whatsoever man soweth, he shall also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. If you are sowing to watching violent, perverted, ungodly movies, or if you are sowing to watching the news or other things that aren't of God, or even things that don't make any difference, they what will happen is you'll either sow the darkness, you'll reap the darkness, or you'll just sow and reap nothing of that true value. 
Where is your heart? Where are your mind? Where is your thought? Where is your affections? What are you loving? What are you delighting in? Where are your roots at? And he says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could even ask or think according to the power that's worketh in us. What is that power? That is Jesus. That is his promises. That is his word. That is his life already in us. The new covenant. He says, I will write my law upon your heart. And he talks about on your hands, upon your forehead, upon your lips who Christ is. It's supposed to be written in every area of our life as we live by his word, as we abide in him and his word abides in us. And all of a sudden we overcome. He says unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Unto him be grace in truth through the church by Christ Jesus, world without end. Amen. Let it be. Psalms 1, 4 through 6, it says, remember, we were talking to blessed is a man who walketh not by the world's counsel in the news, in their entertainments, who doesn't live and act like things of the world, who doesn't, who doesn't be, isn't moved by fear and doubt and unbelief, but his counsel, his faith, his trust, his life, his goals, everything about him is in God and his word. And he says, but the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You know, there's a New Testament scripture verse. He says, that you may grow in Christ to where you no longer will be moved by deceit, by lies of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceit. He says, as when you abide in Christ, you and his word abides in you, as you know his word, as you know his will, the devil will no longer be able to deceive you the, no, the, through through a lying whispers in your ears, uh, by things in the news, by things in the world, or by people you think are right with God who tell you stuff that's contrary to the word and the will of God. And he says, you will no longer be like the ungodly who are blown away by the wind and like a chaff. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the ungodly shall perish. He says, those who say they write with me, but who do not walk in my light, who do not walk in my love, who do walk, walk in my holiness, my nature, my character. He says, they are not founded in they are not rooted and grounded in my word. They're not rooted and grounded in loving God and loving others, but they're rooted in other stuff. He says, if they don't repent, they will be blown away. They will be burned up with the fire as it talks about in John 15. He says, I will say unto him, I never knew you. Depart from ye workers of iniquity. And he goes and he says, for the Lord knoweth and leads and guides and directs their step and protects the ways of the righteous. But the un way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, we're going to talk about the way is straight and narrow, and that's talking about the word of God. So if you're walking in God, if you're walking in his word, if you're walking in the light as he is in light, God can lead you, God can protect you. But if you're not, the devil's just one step away from snuffing you out, one step away from taking you away from God. One step, that's why it says, work out your salvation with fear and trouble for it's God who worketh in you both the will and to do of his stature. He says, if the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? If you think you're right with God, but your roots are not in Jesus, but in other things, he says, you're lying and deceiving yourself. And he goes, for the no, he says, goes and will go on in John 1, 5 through 7. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. He says nothing, no man, no emotions, no demonic attack, no thing of this world will be able to stand before you all the days of my life. He says, as I was with Moses, who came into the greatest kingdom and said, by God, let my people go, who says, if you don't, here's God's judgment. Here is the word of the Lord. And he practically destroyed the strongest kingdom in the world by one man, but it wasn't a man. It was a person surrendered to God who God worked through mightily. Remember, exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. He says, as I was with that man who destroyed by my commandment the greatest kingdom on the earth who brought you out of slavery, who brought you through the wilderness where your clothes and your shoes did not even wear out, to where you had food in the middle of the desert, where you had water out of a rock, where I did all these great signs and wonders for you. As I was 
was with that man, I will be with you. I will not fail thee, nor forsake you. Sometimes I think we need to just meditate on it. God will not fail you, nor forsake you. If you have failed, if you have felt forsaken, you've either listened to the lie of the enemy, or you've gone away from the Lord in that area, because God is not our problem. Ourselves are our problem. The devil might be working. The flesh might be working through the world or the devil. I mean, the, the, the devil might be working through the world or our, our people we know, but God did not fail us or forsake us. And he says, be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for inheritance the land, which I swear unto the fathers to give them. You know, sometimes I think we should think a preacher should be taught this. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. I will help you preach the truth. I will move mightily through you to where people can be saved, healed, and delivered to where they can come into the promised land. And he goes on, which I, he says, I will give them for inheritance, which I swear unto the fathers to give them. Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. He says, I have come to save the people from their sin. He says, I have given them all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He says, all my promises in, our, in me are yes and amen. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed in the past, he'll heal now. If he's saved from sin, he will save now. If he's healed the brokenhearted, he'll broke, heal the brokenhearted now. If he's given faith, hope, and joy, then... He will give it now. He will not fail nor forsake us. Now, if we fail or we forsake us, we just need to admit that we failed. Instead of blaming God, who is the Father of light, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, there's no evilness, there's no wickedness, there's no double-mindedness, there's no uh, manipulations and deceptions and vileness, but in the devil there is. In our natural flesh there is. We are our own problem. When we listen to the lies of the enemy, like the Hebrew children, God says, I will take you through the desert. I will take you into the promised land. It was only supposed to last 40 days. Yes, there was a time of testing trials. There was a time of struggles. But guess what? Because they did not seek their roots deep in the word, because they did not sink their roots deep in Christ, all of a sudden what happened was that 40 days became 40 years. And how many of us, the 40 days that God would have led us, protected us, and guided us, and blessed us, even in the middle of the wilderness, became 40 years because we did not have faith and trust in him, because we did not sink our roots deep in Christ. And I'm not attacking anybody because we have all been guilty. I remember when I was 19, 20 years old, and I'm now in my 40s, that I knew the word of God was the answer, but to let the devil get me distracted by multiple ways. One is I tried to do it in my own strength instead of saturating myself in Christ and overcoming. I tried to overcome sin, overcome the world by my flesh. And I just, I lost, I kind of just gave up. And I just, you know, I didn't go out into the world like maybe some, most people would think. I just kind of, you know, you know, started reading fiction, started watching movies, started doing things like this. And all of a sudden, what could have been a growing grace, a growing peace, a growing joy became many years of being in the wilderness, going in circles because I did not look to Christ. I did not seek my roots deep in Christ. And that happens to all of us. When we get listen to the lies of the enemy, where we try to find our hope, our peace, our joy, our life in others. I've heard stories of men and women who thought they could find their life in their husband or wife to be, and they just grabbed somebody. And then they had a horrible life because they did not find their love and their affections and their hope in Jesus, but they tried to find it in a person. Or how many of us who thought we could get peace and joy and excitement by buying a house or buying a car or, or buying some physical thing, but it didn't work? How many of us who thought our answer was in physical worldly education, but then we get majorly in debt and all of a sudden we're paying that off for many years and we're not even working the job that we were there. How many of us are finding our roots, our life and other things? How many of us who had, how many of us who have been parents? I, I'm not a father or mother yet, but how many people have been parents who all of a sudden they got caught up in the world and they didn't even realize it, but they didn't go to church as much 
as they should. They didn't lighten God as much. They, they were too busy in trying to pay off their house, pay off their car. They were too busy in the things of this world. They bought the world's lie that their, their children needed a worldly education. And they sent them into public school. They sent them into worldly colleges. And all of a sudden, those kids grow up and they no longer believe in God or they don't have a strong faith because people did not root themselves in Christ, but they rooted themselves in many other things but Christ. We've all been guilty of it to an extent, whether it be small or major. And we need to get honest before the Lord and say, Lord, I repent for looking to the world for my entertainment. I repent to the Lord for looking to um, the news. I repent of looking to finances to make me happy or a car or a vehicle or a computer or a game console or anything else or to, or to a person. But I look to you, Jesus. I sink my roots deep in you. I put my hope, my trust, my confidence in you. And he says, be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for inheritance his land, which I swear unto your fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which so Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whither thou goest. He says, God says, I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. I will be with you like I was with Moses. I will do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. You will have everything you need but he says you need to root yourself in me you need to root and ground yourself in me and my word he says don't turn to it don't turn from me and my word to the world don't turn from me and the, my word to what other people say when it doesn't line up with my word and he says then it goes on and it says, this book of the law, or you could say this Bible, the word that God has given us, shall not depart out of your mouth. How many of us let the word of God depart out of your mouth? I'm talking to all of us, whether it be the one who just got saved or the one who's been saved for several decades. When we go to talk to people, what are we talking about? Are we talking about what the government's doing? Are we talking about our bills? Are we talking about the newest technology? Are we talking about what our neighbors talk? Uh, done are we talking what are we talking about what comes out of our mouth and it's an example of showing us where our heart and our mind is he says this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth in the new testament it says you let your words be always seasoned with salt always showing jesus always glorifying god and he says this shall not depart of your mouth but thou shalt think ponder continuing study trust in, hope in, rejoice in day and night, that thou mayest know who God is, that thou mayest know the will of God, and that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. He says, when this word is in your mouth, when this word is in your heart, when it's in your mind, when you are rooted and grounded in Christ, he says, you will be able to do all that's written therein. And he says, you will make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. What is prosperity as a Christian? What is prosperity is somebody who says they love and serve God. It's loving God. It's loving your neighbors, loving your enemies. It's forgiveness. It's patience. It's kindness. It's long suffering. God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And all these things shall be added unto you. So first, God wants to make you holy and righteous. He wants to make you kind and gentle. He wants to make you patient. He wants to make you trusting. He wants to make you resting. He wants to make you thankful and grateful, filled with joy. And out of that... You will be a well planted. You will produce much fruit. You will, everything you put your hands to will prosper. Everything you need will be provided for you. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these natural things shall be added unto you. So the true prosperity of God is love, holiness, peace, joy, all that is good. And out of that will flow everything else we need. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. He says, I have commanded you to keep my word in front of your eyes, to keep it upon your lips, to keep it in your mind, to keep it in your heart. I've commanded you to saturate yourself, to dig deep, to put your roots in me and my word and my will. Have strength, 
have courage. Say, Lord, you said this, therefore you mean it. So by your grace, I will speak your word. By your grace, I will trust in you. By your grace, I will rejoice in you. I will speak it. I will meditate on it. I will delight in it. I will saturate myself in it. I will live in you, Jesus, and your word, because I know that you are, and you are a warder of those who diligently seek you. I know that you care for me. I know that you will help me. I know that you are more enough. I know that you will do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. And he says, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Be not fearful, be not doubtful. You know, it says, blessed are those who counsel is not in the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Blessed are those who are not afraid, who are not terrified, who are not worried, who are not anxious, who are not bitter, who are not hopeless, because they find their faith, their trust, and confidence in Christ. You noticed with Peter, when he was walking over the water, he looked to Christ and he saw the Son of God. He saw the Messiah. He saw victory. He saw hope. And when his eyes and mind and heart, when his roots were in Christ, he could walk over the water. He could walk over the storm. But as soon as he got his eyes off of Christ, as soon as fear came in and took root, as soon as his heart and mind looked to the natural, looked to the world, all of a sudden he started sinking and that's all of us. So if you are sinking, if you are struggling, don't beat yourself up. Don't give up. Don't excuse yourself. Just say, Lord, I mess up. I am still drawn to the world. I still try to find my hope, my confidence in some of the things of this world. I might not be known sin, but I still want to watch the news. I still want to watch a movie. I still want to do these things. And Lord, your word says you are my answer, that I'm supposed to find my life, my hope in you, that I'm supposed to be singly eyed to fix upon you, that I'm supposed to keep my mind and my heart to, and all that I am stayed in you. And help me to do that, Father God. He says, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithsoever thou goest. Second Peter 1, 2-4 says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice what it said there? The divine enabling, the divine power of God, the divine faithfulness, the truth, the rest, the peace of God be multiplied through the knowledge or the word of God through knowing who God is, through knowing who Jesus is. And we find out who God is. We find out who God and his word is by his word. When we read and we think about what Jesus said, about what he did, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. He says, if you continue in my word, then you will know me. Then you will be my disciples indeed. And you shall know who I am. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I will make you free, he said. He says, The divine grace and peace of God be modified through who knowing God is, who knowing Christ, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain in life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He says he's given us all of his grace, all of his promises. His mighty power is at work in us, and he's given us all we need through what? For what? To live a life that's upright before him, to have everything we need. He says through the knowledge of him through the word of God, through knowing who God is, and it will lead us into, right here, glory and virtue. It will lead us into overcoming. It will lead us into grace. It will lead us into more truth. It will lead us into holiness and righteousness. It will lead us into the nature and character of God. It will lead us into being fruitful because we are rooted and grounded beside God, who is the river of life. And all of a sudden, the Bible talks about it, and I should get to it here shortly, all of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. We will produce much fruit because we are rooted and grounded in him. He says, to bring us into life and godliness, to give us grace, to give us peace, to give us knowledge of who God is, are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these great and precious promises, you might be a partaker of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. He says, through my word, through my commandments, through my promises, through all that I've written, through all that I've shown in the Bible, he says, you might be 
more like me. You might have my love, my peace, my joy, my kindness, my long suffering, that you might be like me. And he says, you will escape by my word, the corruption that's in the world through lust. He says, now you're clean to the word which I have spoken to you. He, Jesus says he loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it, set it apart from darkness to light, cleanse it, wash it with the watering of word. Jesus says, sanctify them. He was praying to his father, sanctify my disciples by your truth. My word is truth. He says, I want to cleanse them. I want to love them. I want to wash them. I want to set them free from darkness to where they can walk in love, where they can walk in peace, where they can walk in joy, where they can have victory over everything the devil will send at them and that they can be a beaming light to others to where they can lay hands on the sick, where they can cast out devils, where they can raise the dead, where they can heal the brokenhearted, bind up the broken bones, just like Jesus did. And he says, oh, because of his precious promises, he says, for though we walk, and then we'll go on here, we will escape the lies of the enemy because we are founded in him and found in his word. We get our life, our life from Jesus. We are rooted and grounded in him. Second Corinthians 10, three through five says, for though we walk in the flesh, he says, though we live in this world, though we live in this fleshly body, he says, we do not war by the way the world wars. We do not war in our own strength. He said, Jesus says that this excellency might not be of us, but be of Christ. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, are not mental, are not uh, educational, are not societal, are not technological, are not emotional. He says, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down thoughts and ideas and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God. Did you hear what it said? Exalt itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is the word of God. It's who God is. And he says, by knowing who God is, when an idea says, hey, you can go watch this, you can go do this, it pulls it down. When the, the devil whispers to us, you can't overcome sin. God won't heal you. God won't provide for you. God won't pay your bills. God won't hear your prayers. He won't reach your, your, your brother and sister. He won't reach your kids. He won't help you. The word of God says, Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. It says, if you, whatever you ask according to your will, believing, he, knowing he hears us, if he hears us, we know we have the request we required of him. We know that that guy and all of his household would say, we know the truth of God. And it pulls down the temptations. It pulls down the things, the lies of the enemy to try to make the devil or the world or our circumstances or our government or anything else seem like it's higher than God. He says, exceedingly great and precious promise. He says, he is more than enough. He says, he laughs at those, the, 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 the kings and the princes who try to do evil. He turns their hearts like a river. He says, they are like dust to him. And we exalt everything else but Christ. But that's because we're not rooted and grounded in Christ. Our eyes aren't our singly eye to fix upon Christ. We don't trust in him, hope in him, delight in him, rejoice in him like we should. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you today. Get in Christ. Get in his word to where your life is in Christ because he is more than enough. He will not fail you nor forsake you. And that is a promise. And he has never lied and he can never fail. But we can listen to the lies of the enemy and we can fail because we are not rooted and grounded in Christ. He says, Casting down thoughts and ideas in honor of God, casting down every lie or a circumstance that exalts itself against who God is and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ saying, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law to I love. He will heal me. He will save me. He will deliver me. He will help me. He is more than enough. He hears my prayer. He, the, he who spared not his own son, how much more with thee shall he also freely give us all things? He's given us all things that pertain in life and godliness, exceedingly abundantly. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And he says, bringing every even thought into obedience. Now, this is what we're supposed to be going for, to where we are covered with the full armor of God, the hope of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, where another place where it talks about faith and love, a, a faith in Christ and a love in Christ over your heart, the shield of faith whereby you may quench all the fiery darts, two-edged sword, where you can say, devil, that's not true, or when, the or when you realize something in you that's not of God, you can cut it off and say, Lord, I don't want this anymore. Our feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace, 
all of a sudden we will be victorious in Christ. John 7, 37 to 38 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He says, If any man of you realize that you need help, come to me. Sink your wreaths deep by my river. Drink of me, eat of me. He says, he that has faith and trusts in me because he takes me at my word. As the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow love, peace, joy, rivers of living water. Do you want Jesus? Do you want his word? Do you want love? Do you want peace or do you want joy? Or do you want fear or anger or bitterness and lust and covetousness? Think what you want. And then make sure you're planting the right seed. Make sure your roots are going in the right direction. Make sure you're filling your heart and mind with Christ and his word. And he goes on and he says, oh, actually, we'll flip out back to John 6, 53, 57. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He says, except you find your roots and your hope and your joy and your fulfillment and your nutrients in me. Unless you eat and drink in me, you will have no life because in Christ is life. In him we live and move and have our being. And everything else is, you know, it says, if you continue my word, then it says, in the flesh is no profit. It is my spirit that quickens. The flesh profit is nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And I, prof- I don't know if I've so he said, so in other words, he's saying in me, there's life, but in everything else you are trying to find life. There's a song looking for love in all the wrong places. But I think what we could change that is looking for life in all the wrong places, looking for hope, looking for joy, looking for entertainment, looking for knowledge, looking for fulfillment, looking for a future, looking for our dreams, looking for our forgiveness, looking for our, our eternal things, looking for all that we need in all the wrong places instead of Jesus and his word. He says, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, whoso eateth my words that I speak, whoso eateth of my word, because Jesus was the word made flesh, whosoever sees my heart cry, how Jesus acted, how he lived, how what the Father did. He says, whoso eats my word and knows who I am and loves me and lives for me and follows me. He says, they will produce much fruit. We'll have eternal life and I'll raise them up in the last day for my word. My flesh is meat indeed. My heart, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth of my flesh, eateth of my word, eateth of my life, drinketh of my heart, drinketh of my nature and character dwelleth, liveth, and abideth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Jesus says, the only reason I was over the able to overcome sin and the world and the flesh and double, he says, I lived and eated of my Father. I ate his word. I lived in him. I dwelled in him. I hoped in him. I trusted in him. I was rooted and grounded in God. I had my roots to the river of life, which is Father God. And he says, I live by the Father. So he that finds his life in me, he who roots and grounds himself in me and my word, he who finds his foundation in me, he who lives and dwells in me, even he shall live by me. John, and then we go on, John 6, 58, the next verse. It says, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers that eat man and are dead. He that eateth of his bread shall live forever. He says, your, your fathers did eat of my natural blessings, but they did not eat of my word. And he says, they died in the wilderness. He says, I am the bread you need to eat of. I am the living word. What I said, who I am. You know, Jesus Christ himself is supposed to be the chief cornerstone. Jesus studied the word and then he acted upon the word. And Jesus is the perfect example. Jesus is our salva- savior. Jesus is our cornerstone. Jesus is our, our hope, our trust, our confidence. And how do we get to know that Jesus? How do we get to know his will? How do we find ourselves rooted and grounded in him? How do we find ourselves his disciples? How do we find our life in him? By his word, by his promises, by who he is. And he says, 
goes on to verse 59. These things saith he to the synagogue. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many are there four of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself, the disciples murmured, he said to them, does this offend you? He says, I told you, you need to find your life in me. I, I told you, you need to eat my flesh and drink your blood. I told you, you need to love my word, to love my will and not the things of this world. And he says, you said this is hard. He says, because part of you still wants the world, still wants the flesh, still thinks the movies are going to fulfill you, still thinks the worldly knowledge is going to fulfill you, still thinks the news is going to comfort you, still thinks man and woman are your answer. And he says, oh, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He says, in me is life. In me is your hope. He says, outside of me there's death. And he goes, he says, what? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, he says, what's going to happen when I'm no longer here right in front of you? He says, I'm trying to teach you a truth to where you need to eat of who I am, drink of who I am in my word to where you will know who I am. You will know my will. You will be protected and grounded in me. He says, you will be drawing from the well of living water. He says, you will be well-founded and unmovable, unshakable in me. And he says, if you don't get that now, once I'm no longer in front of you, what are you going to do? And that's us as Christians after Christ is done. We can't see Christ 24 seven physically in front of us like they could. But even he told them, he says, you've got to eat and drink of my word. You've got to abide in me and my words got to abide in you. Therefore you can produce much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. He says, what are you going to do when you can't see me in the natural, when you can't see me in the flesh? He says, I'm telling you, I'm telling the people after you, eat and drink of me. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your mind and heart stayed on me. Abide in me and my word abides in you. And he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit in their life. They are my breath. They are my holiness. They are my promises. They are my peace. They are my joy. They are my seed that I'm trying to plant in your life. They are the rivers of living water. They are the, they are the foundation that you're supposed to build yourself on. He says, is the spirit my word that quickeneth you? The flesh profited nothing. The news, the movies, the games, the things of this world, the worldly education, uh, self-confidence, all these things that we try to find, our medical field, all these things we try to find our life in. He says, they profited nothing. He says, it is my word that quickeneth, my word that profits you. He says, the words I speak, he says, it, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the world and the flesh profit nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are the river that they are the abundance. They are the, 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 the grace, the peace, the joy that I want to give you, the promises I want to give you, the life I want to give you, the knowledge I want to give you. And he says, but there are some of you that believe not. Some of them did not take God at his word and says they didn't realize that Christ was their answer. They didn't realize that they needed to abide in Christ. They didn't realize that they needed to eat and drink of the blood, the word of God. But they tried to find their life in other things. And that's what happens. And we go on here. I don't know if I'll reach it to where uh, he, Jesus says, he who hears my sayings and doeth them, he's like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. And no matter what comes against him, nothing can make us stumble. Nothing can take him fall. But the one who does not take a hold of my word and does not do my word. He says, it's like a foolish man who thought he could build his life upon the world, the shaky sand. You know, everything in this world is temporal in the natural. The only thing that's not is spiritual. It's Christ, it's his word, his eternal values. If you build your life in the world, you will get sick. You will die. Uh, the thieves will come through and steal. The government will come in. Uh, somebody will scam you of your wealth. All the things in this world are temporary and they cannot be built upon. Nothing in this world will fulfill you, whether it be the smallest candy or whether it be the largest skyscraper. Whatever you get in this world will not fulfill you. Our life, our life is supposed to be in Christ. He says, So for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So our 
there, so the people who did not believe in Christ, who left Christ after this, he says, many from that point walked away and they no longer walked with them because their roots were not in Christ. They were like the wealthy man who was trying to serve God, but God says, you still have something that's got you by the throat. Your roots are still depending on something else. You still are drawing your nutrients, your fulfillment in life from your wealth. And he says, I want you to strip yourself of this final chain around your neck. I want you to st- no longer put your roots in money and the things of this world. He says, I want you to sell what you have. And did you notice he didn't say, give to me. He wasn't a covetous person. He wasn't after their money. But he says, I want you to use that money to help people, to glorify God, to do the work of the kingdom. He says, give that money to the poor, help people. And he says, then fall, come and follow me. And he says, you will have eternal life. And that's what he's telling to us. He says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So where is your roots? Is it in the world? Is it in money? Or is it in Jesus and his word? Jeremiah 15, 16 says, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You know, it's just the joy of our Lord is our strength. You know, you're rejoicing in him because he's overcome sin. You rejoice in him because he provide over your needs. You rejoice in him because in him we live and move and have our being that that we can do all things through Christ your strength. And we're going to be together with him for all eternity. We have heaven before, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, to, endured dying to the what the flesh wants, despising sin, and is found in righteousness, found at the right hand of God, is found in the kingdom of God because they knew what the joy, they knew what the, the reward, they knew the heavenly value, they knew the pearl of great price, they knew the treasure hidden in the field, and they were gladly willing to no longer find their life in the world, to no longer root themselves and ground themselves in things that aren't, not, that aren't spiritual, that aren't eternal value. And he says, thy words were found, and I found, it eat them. I saturated myself. My, I loved them. I abided in them. I founded myself upon them. And thy word, thy truth, who you are, became my joy, my rejoicing, became my joy unspeakable and full of glory, became my peace that passed all understanding, became the love that overwhelms me, that saturates me, that pours out of me. He says, they became my life. He says, for I am called by a name, O Lord God of hosts. He says, I know you're my Lord. I know you're my God. I know you're a provider. I know you are all that I need. Nehemiah 8.10 says, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be you sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. They had a heart after God. They had just got done listening and reading the word of God, doing the will of God. They had just got done rededicating their life to God. And all all of a sudden, God says, I'm going to eat, feed you with good things. I'm going to give you things that are good to drink. And he says, even here, he says, send portions of them that nothing is prepared. He says, I am going to exceedingly abundantly bless you above all you can ask or think. And he says, eat it with joy and thankfulness, but take of that which you don't need and give to others. And in other words, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Freely you have received, freely give. The joy, knowing who God is, having loving him and seeking him, being rooted and grounded in him, knowing the word of God, you know, rededicating your life to him, you will be filled with joy. And you'll be able to fill others with his nature and his character and his joy. Matthew 4, 1 through 4 says, Then was Jesus led up in the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. So Jesus went through the same thing the way the Hebrew children did. God led them through the desert to where he could set them free from sin, that he could set them free from the world, that they could leave Egypt behind, that they could leave the world behind, that they could realize their faith, their hope, their trust was in God by his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And that's what we're going to read here. And when the tempter, the devil had come, He said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If what God said is true, if who God says he is, if God will keep his promises. In other words, God, the devil tried to make Jesus question what God said, who his promises are, are his commandments and everything. And he says, no, I'm not going to listen to your lies, devil. He says, I might have been led into the wilderness like the Hebrew children, but I know that the promised land is on the other side. And he says, I live by my father. I eat and drink of my father. I live by... By the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You could say it. Jesus says, I 
find my life in God. I have my roots in Christ. I know the word of God. I know the will of God. I live by God's word. I live by who God is. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go therein at. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be to find it. Why are there few to be to find it? I'll break it and make it obvious. Few there be that find the narrow gate, the straight path, or they stray off the path. You know why? Because they're not reading the map. Uh, you can. We've all had stories of where before GPSs came along, we we tried to take a shortcut or we read the map wrong or all these things, and we get we get we get lost. We go the wrong direction, and all these things happen. And we can, some of these even can see uh, funny stories that we can tell our kids or tell people that we get to know. But when it comes to spiritual truth, it's not a laughing matter. He says. My word is a map. It is a guidepost. It is a direction to lead you into, out of the darkness, into love, into peace, into joy, in my nature, my character. He says, few be that find it because they don't know my word. And it even goes on. He says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by the fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? He says, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast in a fire, wherefore by their fruits you should know them. He says, if somebody's trying to tell you what way to go to get to heaven, but their fruits are not of God, they're filled with covetousness, they've got beautiful mansions that they don't need, they've got cars and planes and stuff that they don't need, if they're living for the things of this world, if they're filled with pride, if they're nasty, if they're ugly, if they skew sin, he says, you will know them by their fruits. Do not follow those who do not have the nature and character of God. Even Paul himself, one of the mightiest apostles, said, follow me as I follow Christ. He said to the Bereans, they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they studied the word of God to make sure what I said was true. So if Paul himself says, if me or any other person preach a different Jesus, a different gospel, do not follow us. Paul himself says, if I change my mind and start preaching against what Jesus says, if I preach against what the word says, do not follow me. That was the fear of the Lord on Paul. That if you, let's say somebody has a heart after God, but they preach something that isn't of God, you can pray for him, you can cry out for him, but don't follow him in that lie of the enemy. Don't follow that in that deception. Do not glorify men above God. Do not glorify your own feelings, your own experiences over what Jesus said, over what the word of God says. Once again, the way is straight and narrow that leadeth to life. And few there be to find it because they don't know who God is. They don't know the word of God. They don't know the will of God. They're too busy listening to the world or they're too busy listening to preachers who say they know God, but in their acts, they deny him. And he says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth my will, the Father in heaven. He says, those who know who I am, who know my will, who know my word, and do it, he says, they will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, and I will say unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. So you could say, so far I've been saying all this stuff is because of the word of God that you know is straight and narrow, that you will not believe the lies of the enemy, that you will walk in uprightness, that you will walk in obedience. But guess what? The next verse pr proves it. It brings it home. It says, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth him, I will liken unto him a wise man which built his house upon a rock. I will liken him to a person who believed me, who stayed in my word, who built his life, who rooted and grounded himself, who founded himself in my word, in my nature, in my character. And he says, the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. It was founded upon Jesus. It was founded upon his word. It was founded upon it will. It knew the straight and narrow path. It knew the truth and did not believe the lies of the enemy. It didn't, you know, 
It didn't walk in sin and darkness and excuse himself because they pray for people and they become healed or because they say, Lord, Lord. He says, because they were built upon my rock, they will know the right path. They will know what is the truth. They will not be deceived by man's lies. He says, they will not walk in sin. They will not walk in darkness, but they will walk in holiness. They will walk in truth. They will walk in victory. They will walk the straight and narrow path because they hear my sayings and they do them. And he says, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rains ascended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. How many times in our life has certain areas of our life has not been founded upon Jesus Christ, has not been founded upon his word, has not been rooted and grounded in the river of living water and that area of our life fails. But once again, remember, he says, I will not fail thee or forsake thee. He says, all my promises and yea and amen, greater than I than am in you, than he that's in the world. He says, you have victory, you have peace, you have joy. But because we are founded and rooted in other things besides Christ, therefore we stumble, therefore we fall, therefore we start drowning. Because our eyes and our minds and hearts aren't stayed on Christ, they're not stayed in his word. I'm going to go ahead and end in this word. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by his love, his forgiveness, his kindness, his gentleness, all that he is, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Like he said to them, I, I ask that you deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. I ask that you sell everything you don't need and give it to the poor. I ask that you root and ground yourself in me, that you eat and drink of me. He says, because of my blood upon the cross, because I provided for you, because I've been patient, because I've been kind, because of all that I've done, by my mercy, by all who I am, my goodness, I ask that you give me your heart, that you give me your mind, that you give me your thoughts, that you give me your time, that you find your life in me. And he says, do no longer find your root, your grounding, your, your fulfillment. No longer be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, changed, washed, renewed by the renewing of your mind by my word, by my will, by who I am, that you may know what is good, that you may know what is acceptable, that you may know what is the perfect will of God and you may walk in it. And that is what we're supposed to do. Our roots, our grounding, our foundation is supposed to be in Christ, supposed to be in his word. So help us, Father God to be rooted and grounded in love, to be rooted and grounded in your truth, to be rooted and grounded in your word, to eat, to drink, to love, to abide, to be built, the foundation built upon you and upon your word. This I pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen.